Okay, here we go, Andre. Um, we are now recording, and so we are now live, live technically. Uh, so uh, tell us why we're meeting today. Yeah. So uh, um, Roger and and I and then Philip, you know, Phil Patterson. Um, yep. I think he's been the pod, he's been the podcast. Um, has, and, uh, yeah, he's been once. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has. I think I saw him. So. Um, yeah, so he's he's the physio, one of the physiologists there at, with with Mox Monitor. So he does a good job. He writes all the like the ebooks and things like that. And so, does a great job we, on. Sorry to cut you off. Just plugging his Instagram because he's doing a fantastic job over there and writing up some really really good posts posts on physiology in general and bioenergetics. So for people who don't follow Phil, go follow Phil on Instagram. He's at Critical O two, I believe, uh, on on Instagram, which is uh, apropos. So go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, he does. He's a really good job. He's, he's a great guy. He's interesting and yeah, works really hard. Um, and so we've got uh, we we've been trying to take a bunch of this 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 critical power muscle oxygenation relationship um, things together, bring those together, and try to make it palatable for mm. for users, right? Um, so specific for us, for Oxy users, but kind of near as users in general. Um, and we've come up with this 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 idea, or I guess we put together this. It's kind of analysis profile that we're calling a critical oxygenation profile to help uh, to help people kind of um, wrap their head around um, uh, the slopes, so muscle oxygenation slopes, mm -hmm. and that being kind of this a lot of the inf important information being kind of hidden in in that slope information, um, and and how can we uh, convey that information to to athletes to coaches, and so we think this new profile. Um, kind of sends that message home or, or uh, to, to users better than some of the other ways that we've been presenting data. So uh, Phil Phil's writing an ebook on that, and me and Phil and if, uh, we did some data collections and uh, are are putting manuscript together to publish something to present this idea of this critical oxygenation profile as mm -hmm. uh, potentially something something useful. Mm -hmm. We put it up on the forum to try to just go get more data, get get Mox users involved in this project. To get a lot of folks uh, send you some uh, some CSVs. No, that has, hasn't been super successful. But you sent me some, so we're <laughs> actually going to look at your data today. Yes. So I did the analysis. We'll look at your data. Yeah. Um, cool. And I did some some prep because I actually before this I I recorded a quick video for my YouTube channel where I go I go over this and there's some you know slides. I try to talk a little bit about some of the research that that uh, preludes this kind of you know that that built up that we built up on. Mm -hmm. This critical oxygen profile was built up on on a bunch of this research. Yeah. Um. So I I put some slides together just to help with visuals. Do you want to do you want to go through those two? Yeah, maybe because I think I mean for me it's it was kind of an aha moment when I saw your paper and and then Brett's paper as well earlier yeah. last year. The 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 fact that we're getting because the the critical power concept is from from my perspective, which is not as an academic, because I'm not, um, I'm really like an end user, but it's such an interesting and applicable tool to, yeah. to then training for or planning for training and determining the profile of an athlete. Uh, and then how they might, cause again, two people with the, to take a very basic example, two people with the same 2k time on a, on a rower, um, might not get there by the same internal strategies. And so the output is the same, but the, uh, the, the, the inner workings are not. And so being able to, well, knowing this is going to potentially help you refine the, the, the training, uh, the, the program, um, so that it's more personalized to, or individualized to the athlete and their respective profile. And so that's super interesting, but it, it remains, but if it's a, but even, I don't know, uh, it remains a mathematical, uh, concept or model. And so there's math involved and then people say, but it's just math. It's not physiology, but being able, you guys coming in and linking, muscle oxygen and the critical power concepts uh it well essentially makes them in, into one and one and the same because you have so if you if you will you have the output on the critical power side you have watts to if we speak in in cycling terms for example and then you have uh some physiological measure on the inside and if those you can link those two together it, it just seems to me extremely powerful as a as a, as a link, do you, do you see it the same way? Would you describe it that way? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and so, um, 
there's, there's a couple. So, I mean, the, the links to how there's a one is like this performance output. And then there's the strategy to talk about how do we do the performance? What we're doing here doesn't, that's like this idea of maybe it's this idea of what people have different limitations to, to their system, to their mm -hmm. output mm -hmm. that may or may not, but it's definitely not the focus of what we're going to talk about today, but it's more this link between the app that this critical power as, 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 as sustainable metric, mm -hmm. like this is, this is your sustainable performance and that being reflected by a physiological measure like muscle oxygenation. And so that this critique that critical power, it's, it's mathematically derived. So there's going to be limitations. So there's like a yes and no to that. The, the problem with critical power is just that, how do you fill in data points, right? And so anytime you, you try to generate a model on very few data points, there's, it's going to be inaccurate. And so that's mm -hmm. often the problem with critical power is that, you know, if, if you take, and there's a bunch of studies on this, so they'll do five time trials and then they try to make the critical power curve based on three points. I'll take the first three, the last three or the three in the middle it and changes. you get significant differences, right? But the point would be you have to take all five and best would be you would take 10 points or 20 or a hundred, and then you would get closer and closer to what it is. Yeah. Um, and so the, the problem isn't the phenomenon of critical power. I think that is true. Um, and, and you can derive it mathematically, but you have to fill the model with enough data points and, and, and then you just don't fill enough data points. Yeah. And, and right to your point, I think um, if the, if any, thing changes in the environment and the, you know, readiness status of the athlete, that the fatigue, critical power, the value itself is going to change. So you go at altitude. Now you need to do another five or 10 tests to figure out what your value is after a three hour ride while your critical power is not the same anymore. Cause now you're glycogen depleted and you're fatigued. Uh, so that's going to influence it. And so if I understand correctly, bringing that uh, critical O2 component uh, is makes it uh, 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 you can you can track it in real time and you can use it practically to uh, assess where you are relative to that threshold on a day to day basis if if that's what I understand correctly which makes it which makes that medical mathematical uh, model of critical power extremely applicable and it's it's not applicable to you know do an MLSS test every day to see where your maximum internal steady state might be. But if that can be reflected with something like the MOXIE, then you're able to look at this from a day to day and then figure out where you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It's okay. just, it's, it's a tool that, that can I, I mean, essentially without ever doing edit critical power tests, the IOD bank, you put a MOXIE on, you go out and ride and you ride through a profile performance you should find out where where critical power is. We're going to call mm -hmm. it sustainable, but it's just maximal performance for muscle oxygen zero slope. That's mm -hmm. critical power. Yes, um, that's your sustainable performance, right? And then you would you would track that. And the idea again there would be because we're not machines, critical power mathematically is like three hundred watts, right? That's the number you get. Physiologically, like you said, that's not the point, and and that and that can vary. I mean that that could technically speaking if you are to ride for three hours and your glycogen depleted your critical power changes mm. right not the, and and you should be able but you still have a critical power it's just it just <laughs> changed right this is now critical power is just the sustainable performance and it's just not gonna be the same anymore mm. and hopefully physiological measures will reflect that better because it's a reflection of you as a person and not a, a mathematical output well, I guess the phenomenon the, is still the same though, right? It's what's sustainable performance. Yeah. And, and maybe what, what sticks out to me is that muscle oxygen is something that's now really easy to quantify. And whereas if you look at the other internal metrics or uh, yeah, internal metrics that have been used to assess above and below critical power, I'm just thinking of, uh, I think it was pools research, or uh, I think it was with Andy Jones as well. And they looked at, you know, phosphocreatine and some other uh, using PNMR, I believe, um, which is not accessible to, you know, just using that within your training session to see where you stand relative to that set threshold. So it, it just brings together, uh, I guess, the accessibility with the robustness of the model itself um, and puts it all into, into one, which is, which is pretty cool to say the least.
Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's basically with all of these metrics. So uh, the the studies that, that you mentioned, so the the phosphorus magnetic magnetic resonance spectroscopy, the PMRS studies. Oh yeah, yeah. So they just do that the high energy phosphate measures. So they just show that if you're above below critical power, it's you get a steady state in these these metabolites and these high energy phosphates, or you don't get a steady state. Mm -hmm. um, this the same thing happens with um, with like gas exchange, right? Or, or do you mm -hmm. find a steady state in gas exchange or not? Um, and the same thing happens with, with muscle oxygenation. Um, the, and, and I don't know if any one of those tools per se is more or less accurate. Right? You can discuss about the accuracy of all the tools, but what I do know is that using an MRI is impossible. Um, <laughs> and, and exercising every day with, uh, with a face mask, you can do that. I mean, there's tools that let you do that every day. It's just not very comfortable, mm -hmm. and um, a nearest device on on your your quad is just it doesn't hamper you in any way. No, no, I agree. So that's that would be the point. Yeah. Um. So if if there's other tools, you you could use other tools, right? But just most there aren't really that many. That, yeah, right. That right now there there isn't, and that's probably for a discussion for another day. The DFA Alpha One I think is very interesting for at least that first threshold. Uh, I've been I've been playing with it quite a bit and. It seems fairly robust when it works. I it really, I have a 85% confidence in the signal uh, with all the tests that I've done. For some people, it doesn't work. Uh, if the artifacts are high, it's going to mess up too much and you can't get anything out of it. Uh, running is hard because of the shocks. So, but on a bike, it's like a 90%, I'd say accuracy slash success rate with, with that metric. And I think if you get that for your first threshold, and maybe we could talk later about MO2 on that front as well, but, and then you have, your critical O2, if you have your, your, you know, your slope, um, then you have potentially both of those uh, thresholds in real time with very accessible equipment, which is um, very exciting. Did, did you want to start with uh, a couple of slides to, to kind of lay the foundations and, and then look at the data or how do you want to play it? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. I have your data on slides too, actually. So, okay. Like your um, analyzed data. You should be able to share your screen, I believe. Let's see. This is, oh uh, yeah. All right. You get that? Does I get that, that still gonna work if I do if I do presentation mode? Is that still gonna work? It might. It might just still... uh, make our faces smaller. Did that work? Am I in presentation mode? You're in presentation mode. You're in, you're in presenter mode, I believe. So you might, you might need oh, to. Shit, hold on. I got an idea. I'm gonna. Let's see. Share screen. I'm just gonna. Now I'm assuming that'll work. Yeah. Do you only have? Yep, I got the right stuff. Dope. All right, I'm gonna grab. Uh, I can do like laser pointer somewhere, right? All right. You see that laser pointer? I see the laser pointer, and I made our faces smaller, hopefully, so that people can see the the full <laughs> thing. All right. Uh, so I put this together today, so hopefully it's okay. Yeah. So um, the first thing is just um, this is there the publication go. that you one of the publications you're talking about that that mm -hmm. I put together with Dr. Erlacher, just the idea of linking um, uh, nears and critical power. Mm -hmm. The relevant publication is actually this one. Uh, this mm -hmm. is Kirby, and he uh, Brett for, from Nike Lab and his colleagues here from Gonzaga, in Oregon, and so uh, they. Uh, Brett's presented a couple of times at the Moxie Summit on, on this topic. So it's super interesting. And what they essentially show in their publication uh, and in the presentations he did is that um, you're at the slope of your muscle oxygenation. And this is the quad site I'm measuring on the quad, that there's a relationship between slope and time to exhaustion. And so basically the steeper the negative slope, the quicker you're deoxygenating, the shorter your time to exhaustion and mm -hmm. less steep the longer time to exhaustion, right? Um, kind of put in other words, the, the, the steeper the slope, the higher you're above critical velocity. So for running or critical power than if you're, if you're cycling. Yep. And the closer you're to zero slope, the closer you are at to critical power. And that's mm -hmm. what these kind of two graphs show. Um, now, uh, what, what this means, or like maybe it's what's important, and if, if, we, go, if we go to the critical oxygenation profile after, it's kind of like, well, how did they analyze this data? So th this is some data that they had. And what they do is they do like uh, an initial slope. So this red line, right? So they, they just get an initial slope and you get this first initial drop off in, in muscle oxygenation. So for moxie uses, if you do a 3-1 test or a 5-1 test after each break, you get this 
steep drop in muscle oxygenation. Mm. And then followed by that is where you get the actual relevant slope. Okay. And that's like Brett calls it the, the delayed slope in his paper, which is more like this, this second portion, like what's happening to the signal afterwards. Mm. And what you see is that if they do exercise in the severe domain, they get negative slopes. And if they do in heavier or moderate, which is below critical power, they kind of get more like something like positive slopes. Mm. Okay. The, this, the second graph actually shows it, shows it a little bit nicer. So again, you get this initial drop um, and then you get a slope based on, on, these are three time trials at a five and 10 and 15 minute time trial. So the shortest time trials are the highest intensity. You get the steepest slope um, and uh, the, the, the 15 minute long time trial, you get the flattest negative slope, but they're all above, they're, they're all in the severe domain. They're all above critical power. So they're all negative slopes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut this off. This is, these are slope percents. So um, that that's kind of the relevant point here. The relevant point here being that uh, muscle oxygen slope is a function of intensity. Okay. With, with a, now, this isn't with a clear no distinction between below or that you can establish uh, clear behavior, let's say below and above critical power, just like these other metabolites that we can uh, assess through those more advanced measurement techniques in lab settings. Yeah. So if you are above critical power, you're going to generate negative slopes. Yep. That's right. And so this isn't like this, the phenomenon, like this observation isn't something that new either. I mean, these, both of these papers I talked about um, back here, they're 2021 papers. We, they, we both patiently published papers within like two months of each other. Um, and, uh, but, so this is a 20, this is a 2000 papers, 20 years ago. <laughs> Or they do knee knee uh, so knee extension trials, and you also see vasculitis rectus femoris at 20, 30, and forty percent of MBC, and you kind of you basically see the same thing. That's mm -hmm. it's the harder you go, the more you're at a function of slope. Mm -hmm. um, so just to point out that this this is something that's been around for quite some time. It's just trying to bring it bring it to the the forefront of of athletics. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's okay. not it's not new. It just hasn't been put in the limelight because um, why why would you say why would you say this uh, type of perspective on what we're looking at here has not been um, exploited more in recent years given uh, given what we know about it. In my search, so generally, there's always a gap between application and research. That's always like that. There's mm -hmm. very few things go get pipelined from research directly into, into some kind of use. Fair, yeah. And that's a problem. Um, then there's technological problems here with uh, I mean, Moxie Monitors 2013, but, but having you know portable devices that are affordable and portable and usable in athletic sense has been you know moving on to 10 years now, which isn't that long of a, a long of a time. So mm -hmm. that that's gonna be it's going to be a combination of those things. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, and I mean, to a certain extent, there is a, quite a bit of like fitness tracking, physiological measurement. I mean, there's lots of, there are tools out there that people use and people can get also pretty rooted in, in some ideas they have, or if they get comfortable with tools they use and they feel they're not actually looking for anything new. Yeah. Right? So you're kind of like pushing something into like this new, this new field. It's not always that easy. I mean, there's not a lot of money in, in Nears athletic products. So that makes that, sense. That, there's a combination of all those things, but yeah. I'm not, an, I'm not a market analyst. Um, but that was a good market so, analysis though. I have to there, say. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit the background as to what we're doing. And what we, what we uh, want to keep in mind is this idea of this initial slope and this delayed slope. I think yep. that's the important part. And so uh, you sent me your picture, so I put this up. <laughs> nice. There you go. Uh, and you sent me data, and you sent me three data files, or like three Moxie files, right? You had the right and left quad and yeah. the bicep, right bicep. So yeah, I bicep. did an analysis. Yeah, so I did an analysis of the data. Now we see the bicep Moxie right here. And we're going to go over what we did, and we can talk about this, because I think there's going to be something, some interesting things to talk about, or some things that are maybe a little unexpected, and some things that you can go home and, and try out. Uh, try yeah. out yourself and, and see what you think about it. So this is your left VL data. Um, and so this is the raw data signal, the blue, right? That's yeah. the, the MOX data got from you. And so if you kind of look closely, you see that there's like all these colored straight lines in this data. Mm -hmm. 
And those are always the, the initial and the delayed slope. So I made did regression. So you always get and the initial slope regression, which is always the first minute of every step. And then the last two minutes of the steps, you get a second regression line, which is the delayed slope. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And so then what we did is we plot the delayed slopes versus your power. Mm -hmm. Right. That's this graph on the top right here. Um, and what we then end up getting here is we get our, we get a regression. Okay. It's just not very my uh it's not very nicely drawn in here. It's actually over 0. 0.1, 2, 3, 4 is what I do the regression. And what often happens with data, so some data is nicer, some data is less nice, um, is that once you kind of bottom out your, your muscle oxygenation, yeah. you'd have zero sleep. There's no point in putting that into the into the regression that we're doing, right? That's what happens with these last two points. So this mm -hmm. point right here and this point right here. So those are like not in our regression analysis. It's the first four points. And what we see is that it's actually a linear relationship. It ends up being 0.99. Oh, um, so it's that's, super nice and linear. That's pretty clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. So basically what it is, and this is the point is that it's a function. So, um, your, your slope is a function of your performance output. As you go up with the performance, you get, um, this nice linear change in, in how much, um, oxygen demand there is. So you get mm -hmm. this change in slope. Um, and what we, um, what we can then do is we can calculate out an intercept of like, well, where are you going to be at zero slope? Mm -hmm. And so if we extrapolate that out, that's this red point right here where my, my marker's on right now, it's at about 165 watts. Okay. Okay. The idea would then be that that somewhere around there, plus minus the error and resolution problems with the 3-1 test would be something like um, your critical power which is okay. significantly lower than what you calculated out as from your two points, which is something we can talk about after. Yeah. Um, right. and so, we, so that's, that's 160 watt. Is that, so if I understand correctly, is that the zero slope? That would, should be the zero slope. Okay. What, one thing that is very, very interesting. Um, I'll, and I've, um, I'll, I'll let you continue right after. What I've been seeing in terms of SMO2 profiles with all the tests that I've been doing is that sometimes it's, and, and that's VL on the bike. And depending on the profile of the athlete, sometimes it'll go flat down flat. And sometimes it'll go up flat down. Yep. And so if we take zero slope as uh, on someone that is a flat down flat, then theoretically that zero slope would be your first threshold. But if you take zero slope on someone that has an up flat down profile, then that would be critical power for them because it's your second threshold. Is that, and, and then 165 is not far from where I put mine, which is at about 180 right now. So that's just something that came to mind when you talked about the zero slope. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, actually, we have a paper that got accepted for publication as you go into Journal of Human Kinetics. Um, I'm assuming it'll, it'll come out beginning this year or sometime next couple of months. And we do ex basically exactly what you explained is what we also show. So if you look at like a, pen, a paper by Spencer and they, they, they always show this profile as being flat down flat. Right. And they're like, and the point is that happens often, but not in all cases. There's the other way that data can look, which is the one you explained. And so we showed um, this data. And, and for example, in cycling, you get this, um, the, the cycling and running, it's more likely to generate the one or the other profile. Mm -hmm. But so the point is, but well, maybe we you should, well, in the paper that, we're, that we uh, submitted to, or this can be a public human kinetics, we ignore the, the up. But if you do, if you ignore the up, so you, you have the, the flat down flat, which gets you your two thresholds. Mm -hmm. But if you do the, the up flat down, you can actually separate off in, in the, all the data that we had, the down into two parts. You get down and you get plummet to hell down. Like it goes down and then it goes really down. Okay. And you can, that is actually the second threshold. Okay. You should look at your data again and see if you have a clear, like even more down in the down. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, like it'll go down like this and you're like, oh, that's my threshold one. 
and yeah. then it goes bam. <laughs> yeah. Now what That's what what I usually too. see is uh, on on those I I call them more endurance profiles or type one profiles, whatever you want to call them. When really moderate intensity domain, it's a clear up upward trend on that. Uh, delayed slope, let's call it. And then when you get into the heavy intensity domain, you're going to have, you're going to have a dip in absolute value, but you are going to have a flat trend uh, pretty much all the way to uh, that second threshold. And what I do is I triangulate the sec, the both thresholds. I use all the measurements that I have to try and be as uh, precise, not, not as precise, but as uh coordinated with the, given all the systems that I have access to. So I look at the, uh, at the breathing and I look at the muscle O2. I also look at the SMO2 profile of the non-evolved muscle, because that often, uh, starts pulling downwards past that critical power point or that second threshold point, which is quite telling in, in many, many tests that I've seen. Um, so I, I try to go at it with, with, with all of this and, um, And so, it, but I, I also see, again, it's not perfect. And I've got dozens of tests to, to testify to that where it's physiology, it's messy, not, a, not two, no, no two people look the exact same. No people react the exact same. And so there's a, there's a huge component of actually, for me, at least when I look at the data now is like taking a bird's eye view and really looking from afar because If you get lost in the minutia, again, if, if all I looked for was a flat down flat uh, for my, my, my profile and finding those thresholds, I would miss the boat completely on people that are up flat and down. And so looking at RP, looking at how they breed, looking at DFA alpha one, um, all that usually gets me pretty close to, uh, to, 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 uh, I don't know if it's the truth, but it seems coherent with all the systems that I have access to, but it, it's interesting that you've seen the same thing. I feel like I feel, I feel more confident in what I'm doing, hearing that you see that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would definitely go, go look at your, your up, up flat downs and see if, if in the downs you see a nonlinearity, like if you see you, okay, it's a down and then it's a down, mm. you know, see if you find that as well. Yeah. I'll have a look. For sure. Um, to take a look, um, because we found that, like, if we did those regressions, um, we found that the, the, those, if you, if you try to generate a, a, a segmented regression there, that that point that optimizes the line mm. um, ends up being like your your second threshold, which otherwise you wouldn't find if you were looking for another flat, um, right? Kind of like a a positive inflection point uh, rather yeah. than. Uh, we're looking for then a negative one, but I, I, I hope that paper gets published pretty soon and then I'll send it to you and you can take a look at it and, Please do. and, uh, and see what you think. Please do. Um, yeah. So we'll just quickly go back to this and we'll look at your other. So th this is maybe we'll remember that like your, so 170 ish was your, your, um, would be your, your power, right. That we're calling critical oxygenation here yeah. would be at 170 and your SMO2 would be like 37. Okay. Um, which is something interesting for you to then go try out. Yes, and, that's and that's that definitely works. something that I'll 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 now because I've been doing a couple uh zone two rides with just using the the, the chest strap and looking at DFA. And yeah, that tracks really nice. I did last two sessions I did nice hour, 170 watts, which is technically just under, and I'm 80 to 85 to 92 percent at the time, right above that 0.75. Um, okay. and, and from a breathing standpoint, it, it tracks as well. My feeling is, is, is on point with that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll have to pop up, put the, pop the moxie on the next couple rides and look at if, look at, you know, the, the value and see if that 37 or ish, um, is, is close to it. Yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll yeah, definitely yeah. do that. I'll definitely do that. Yeah, give me, give me feedback on that Yep. now. So if we'll we go to the right VL, this is your right VL data. And you, we do the same thing, right? We did the, the, the initial slope, delayed slope, and we plotted against power. Mm -hmm. And you get uh, the intersect is at about 180. So it's about 10 watts higher, um, yep. which is totally within any kind of error margin. So, and I'll, I'll um, also say, nice. yeah, sorry to cut yep. you off. My left is definitely lagging behind my right. I know that for a fact, um, which now makes all, all its sense when, you, when you're showing me my zero slope at 180, which is like I said, literally where I would put my first threshold right now. And okay. with the, the left leg being a little bit behind the, 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 the right one. 
Okay. Okay. Interesting. That's, I mean, I just, it's nice when things happen out. It could have been the other way and I would have had to explain myself why, <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, I mean, pretty good, right? You get 0.98 relationship mm -hmm. on this. Um, and then interesting then is the bicep. So we do the same thing with your bicep. Oh, wow. And it's at about 190. So you're, it's like 170, 180, 190. Yeah. Um, now, if we'll look at some other data about this, it's always with, with you as an individual, you say, well, 20 watts, that's, a, that's about a 20%, 10% you know, uh, difference over, over 200. So you're mm -hmm. like, that's obviously significant. It is. Um, over lots of people, it's not going to be that big, big of a deal. Right, that the point being is that they're somewhat in vicinity to pretty similar. Right, it's not you're getting negative slopes in the bicep at, at 250 and, and negative slopes in the, at, at 120. Right, so yeah. this is it's giving us a hint that there's some systemic thing happening, or regardless of which muscle you're picking, mm -hmm. in this case, through these three muscles, that you're going to start generating negative slopes around that. Yeah. Okay. That so makes sense. your the idea be that your critical power is somewhere, you know, somewhere just below 200, which is mm -hmm. what I would want you to then go try. So if you do rides like 30 minute rides, how do you feel if you ride at 200 watts? 200 would be just above where I would usually, like I said, I'm 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 doing my long stuff at 170 right now, and yeah. so what I'll what I'll probably do now that you're giving me all of this is I'll strap on with three moxies again. And yeah. I'll do, I'll do an hour ride at 170 and then I'll go do a, on another day, I'll go do an hour ride at 200 yeah. and just to, to see how everything behaves. Cause maybe that will then give us some more uh, information on what's, you know, like you said, it's, it seems to be in that vicinity. And that's where, like I said, we're exactly where I would have put it at 180, right in, right in the middle. Um, or that's, that's what I use actually. So now going to look at those those trends and I'll I'll send them to you and maybe we can do a if you're game we can do a follow up call if you have if you have the time obviously uh, and and look at those you know 170 watts 200 watts which are just about just below and just above what what you gave me here and then look at the different reactions of the three muscles and 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 just get some Seriously. interesting stuff out of that yeah yeah and so maybe we'll quickly go back so um right now so the left vl the, if you do the smo2 value as we said 37 percent, and the right vl will be 39 so it's yeah. basically the same number which is interesting yeah i um, mean in a lot of cases it's like that it's not in all cases um whereas the bicep it's 51 yeah. so the, the point about this muscle site so i think muscle site for the slope probably isn't that important i mean that's the curvy paper with the forearm or the quad right um and i think if you pick the same muscle right or left in most cases, you'll have generally same res value results, but not in all cases, which is then interesting to figure out why that is. And then you get people like, uh, like Jem, mm -hmm. you had on the podcast who then look actually at that um, clinical cases, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of get uh, flow obstructions, uh, which then becomes really relevant for right and left differences. Um, yeah. Passive and Jem actually have very similar things with like plot, slope to power. Yeah. I think, I think I talk, oh, so I've been talking to Gem about that as well. So nice. they, they show very, they have very similar kind of, um, show similar results as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So just so that we're not the only ones doing this. There's lots of people out there no, that's doing cool. very similar things. Yeah. That's really um, interesting. So this is your data. Maybe I'll go through a couple other data things. And then we can talk about the whole concept in general. We can look at your data a little bit more. So mm -hmm. we did this with with a, with a Swiss pro team, a football, so a soccer team for, for Americans um, from the Super League. And we did 12 athletes and we did like these the three one tests. Okay. And we did moxie sites on right and left quad, right and left hamstring, and right and left gastroc. Mm -hmm. um, and we did blood lactate sampling. Yeah. And we established the same profile. So this is an example from one athlete. And this is the le left gastroc, right? And we get the same, the same ideas, right? We get these delayed slopes. We plot them versus speed. We get this linearity that we see here. Yeah. And the purple lines lactate. Yeah. Okay. And so basically, once you start going into negative slope territory, you start increasing lactate, which is discussion. Then um, you're hitting territory where your performance is not sustainable which is what you would expect lactate then to go up and you get these negative slopes. Yeah. And um, would, would that coincide? Cause looking at the, is that a 11.3 meters per second? At the bottom? No, those are kilometers per hour. 
the, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, 11 kilometers per hour. Yeah. With that. So 11.4 kilometers per hour. Yeah. Which would probably be closer to uh, a soccer player's first threshold than critical velocity, right? Yeah. I mean, this is something we should discuss after all of this as well. Okay. Is yeah. like, are we, what are we identifying here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Go right. ahead. So we'll, we'll talk about this after because this is an important point, right? But yeah. And it's also, it's actually, if you, we, do, if you do threshold analysis, the lactate ends up being the critical point ends up being slightly above like a threshold one, but okay. below a threshold two. Hmm. Um, and so this is left gastroc data and the 11.4 is the speed, is this intercept speed. And if you do right VL, left VL, um, it's 11.5 and 12. Yeah, so close. Okay, so they're yeah. all these. All these three muscles are pretty close. Here, he actually has a right. Your right and left intercepts had like the same thirty-seven and thirty-nine percent. Yeah, and this athlete from football player actually has thirty-four and forty-five percent. Actually, a right and left difference that's pretty big. So more wow. than ten percent. Do Do you have any um, left, right, like force plate or strength data on on those uh, athletes? Okay. No. Um, right, same athlete, right, left ham. You get eleven point one and eleven point nine. So all the speed intercepts are between 11 and 12 kilometers an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, um, and here again, you have a right and left difference for the, the intercept of, of oxygenation, 35, 24% uh -huh. with, uh, with both times the left leg. So which uh, the, the right leg has a lower VL, um, but a lower ha a left ham. <laughs> That's like the hamstring and we're in, we're like opposite. Yeah. So again, so we had a little bit careful about placement and adipose tissue thickness and hamstring data is not always that easy to collect, as you know, getting yeah. good placement and clean data. But did, interesting. Did you got VL and not RecFem, right? Yeah, we did. Right. I, I think you, if, if I were to collect data again, I would probably do RecFem just because okay. we did RecFem too. And if you're trying to do things based on what he's doing, you should do RecFem. Um, you get a little bit of, of a different response. I think you and Jem talked about that a little bit. Um, I, I think generally, again, uh, over all these muscles, you're finding like the same intercepts. I'd be amazed if rec fem was completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, no, but it's it's great to so, see that all those muscles show the similar. Well, like you said, it's it's a fairly uh, it's a small bracket. One kilometer per hour is uh, you know it's it's, yeah. it's it's close, and it's nice to see all of them fall in there. So no, that's that's really cool, and having the lactate as well to say corroborate that or add add that dimension to it is really cool yeah so I, we got two more slides and then we'll, we'll be talking so this is like if you take all 12 players and you do the means mm -hmm. um over all the muscles so you get the, the critical speed for the right left vl right left ham right left gastroc um if you do a cycle analysis there there's no difference mm -hmm. for the speed they all spit out the same intercept yeah um, which is, which is, we're talking about, which is what we'd expect if, if this is some kind of systemic response, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is for the absolute SMO two. And so, I mean, the, the example that I showed of the player had right and left actually a pretty big difference, mm -hmm. but if you do the means of all the players, they actually, it, the data spits out, there's no significant difference in the, mm -hmm. in the right and left means again, yeah. point being, Science uses means, but if you're working with athletes, you better not rely on means too much. You need to make sure you're looking at that individual athlete. Um, when actually uh, the, the the hamstrings and the quads have the same SMO2. I mean, yeah. They just have a lot more variation in them. the hamstrings and the quads are actually pretty tight. Yeah. Um, and the only real difference was that the, the right and left gastroc actually showed a difference, which I'm not a, quite sure why that is. It's interesting. Do, so, do you look at who's lefty, who's righty? Um, I have that data, but I haven't done anything with that analysis here. Okay. And and on the hamstring, what comes to mind is previous hamstring injuries. Yeah. So I, I actually don't have that, that information on the players either. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that, that's basically just to get this idea of this critical oxygenation profile, mm -hmm. um, which, which is an interesting concept. And now to the idea of all, what, what does that intercept even mean? Right. Yeah. So if you, if we talk about Brett Kirby's work, we would say, well, having a negative delayed slope means you're above critical power. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, but if we look at our data, or we look at the data that you have, it's much closer to threshold one than threshold two yeah. and critical power should be threshold two. 
Okay. So now I think there's a lot of things going on here. And a lot of it, I think, has to do at least with these soccer players. In my opinion, you can talk to your data. With the soccer player data, I think generally, if you do three-minute step tests with breaks, you overestimate soccer players' performance in continuous running. Okay. And there's there's some publications to, sh to show that as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's first of all, um, it's intermittent, which is already in the, to an advantage of a soccer player. So soccer players do better in, better in shuttle run tests mm -hmm. and uh, in tests with like intermittent tests than they do in continuous running tests. It, it probably has something to do with the, the type of exercise they do. Start and stop is also is also different. Um, and and short, I mean, it, they're relatively short bouts. So if, if you were to make these runner, make these the, the steps five minutes, all their performances would come down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if you take continuous runners like like marathon runners, they're less hampered by that protocol changes. They're more mm -hmm. hampered by start and stop protocol changes that messes them up, but having longer or shorter, um, it's not as big of a deal, especially in that critical area. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's, that's one of the reasons maybe, um, but clearly it, our data right now is closer to a threshold one. It's always, it's always over threshold one, but just by a little bit. Um, but it's definitely always below threshold two. I have an um, idea. Which is why, yeah, go for it especially if you're talking about high level long distance runners. Yeah. How close is Kipchoge's first threshold to his critical velocity? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what his first uh, threshold is. Do you know what it is? I, I heard it was insanely close to his critical velocity. Yeah. Yeah. That, that just gets real tight in like, yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, basically they, they I mean, they, they have very little, I mean, lactic curves end up being super flat too. in a lot of these guys, which, which would, which would bring your critical O2, your zero slope, very close to your critical velocity. If you're yeah. in that, if you, you have that profile, if you're, if your first threshold and second, cause, cause we don't, not every athlete has the same say percent difference or, or, or space between those two thresholds, right? There's yeah. those that have a very low first threshold and then a, fairly high critical uh, power. And then you have those that are really, really close together. And I guess if, I did, if we had to generalize, we could say that the, the longer distance you're going to perform in your competition and the fitter you are, the closer those two are going to match up because you kind of have to be extremely efficient, even at uh, high outputs uh, during long durations to maintain, to sustain those efforts. Um, and so that would bring me to think that the zero O2 slope doesn't mean the same for every athlete, depending on their profile and their, their level or, and their, and their comp, their comp, their spe, their speciality or whatever you would call that their Yeah. Their, whatever their event is, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So that, that might all be very true. Um, and maybe for, for biased reasons, <laughs> I tend to think one of the problems with, so, I mean, this is why I, I want people to just go out and, and run time trials to, to, to figure things out. But if, if you take like this data, I think that at least like if you're taking lactate as some kind of indicator to help us identify what our intercept is indicating mm -hmm. is that, is that because there's this delay component in lactate that lactate is completely overestimating these people's second threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and I think their second threshold is much closer to like uh, to um, what I'm calling critical oxygenation. So I think I think Kirby's more right than what this data maybe would would suggest in this case, where I think the protocol is messing up this data. Like at least the lactate data, right? Okay, so yeah, because so we know the longer, you're getting, yeah, yeah, you're getting delayed, right? So if you the, sh the short, the short, the three minute intervals are too short, and it's kind of it's it's pushing everything out. Um, it's it's also, but I mean, a lot of times it's the protocol. So if you do like critical power tests, this mm -hmm. is why people need to go out and actually do like longer time trials. If you do like a three minute critical power test, and you say the asymptote of your power afterwards or flattens out as critical power the fitter you are in continuous exercise, 
So uh, an elite runner doing a running test like this, the closer that will actually be to their true critical power. The mm -hmm. un the more unfit a person is, the more likely they're going to have significant decreases after three minutes that are still going to take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that, and, that, and then you have a protocol problem, right? It's just giving you the wrong information from the protocol that you're using. Do Do you want? Because I have I did it yesterday. I did uh, more steps, but I did uh, 100 watts plus 25, and I did a 401, and I did it all the way to 325. And oh, I don't know nice. if that's a big enough magnitude change for you to look at. Is there a big difference in the predictive values of the zero slope uh, between this test and that test? And if you need the data, uh, I'm happy to do like a 6-1 or something, 7-1, uh, to see if the longer times would significantly change what we see in the data. Because like you said, if it's about at some point, it's about figuring out what the right protocol is. Um, and you need to be conscious of time, uh, which is, I don't know if, did, did you determine the three minute as uh, the shortest you could do with enough data to pull your two minute slope out? No, no. So, I mean, you need the one minute delayed slope probably. Right. Yeah. In some cases it, it might actually be a little bit more, but I would say you should do one minute. Yeah. And so anything at more than that, three minutes seems nice. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the whole, maybe to get to the point of this, this isn't sacrosanct like this, this kind of profile thing, even if it, if it proves to be useful. The idea is, first of all, um, the better you know yourself, the tighter you would you would do this test. So like if I if you were to do a test again, you would do a three one. But this time you would say, I'm going to focus in around. Hold on, let's go to your data. I'm going to focus in around like 170, 180, 190 watts. So instead of doing, you know, starting way down here, you you would start um, you would start at uh, this is all this is time on that axis. You would start at maybe you know you'd go 160, 170, 180, 190, 210, mm -hmm. and that, I, that, that, the idea being to fill in points up and around and underneath this because the points that are again way above those just aren't that relevant. They just go crazy over here, right? Yeah. So you want to fill in more these these point areas and see if you can get more resolution on that intercept. Yeah, that would be step one. Um, and step two would be instead of doing, you could do longer or shorter steps as well. That's interesting. But for me, it's more about then using your moxie going out and riding mm -hmm. and being like, uh, is this a sustainable performance? Yes or no. Is it, how do I feel? Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously if, if it's something like critical power, it's sustainable, but it's going to feel hard, mm -hmm. like potentially really hard. And if it's sustainable, it feels super easy, then it's, or super easy, or like, you know, very doable. It's going to be something more like a threshold one, which would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. then it, it's kind of a little bit in conflict with, with Brett Kirby's um, publication on what the delayed slope should be. Yeah, because it's, 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 it's interesting. Because really, for, for me, it just makes 100% sense if I'm a flat down flat, that that first inflection point on the zero slope would be my first threshold. Right. I mean, yeah. it, and, but if you, uh, my critical power, it, it might be a little bit under 280 because I'm only using the two point method and it's had, it has its flaws. Uh, but I, I bet, I would bet pretty heavily like a 90, we've been playing with a running kind of joke with Andrew and, uh, and Jem when we make out predictions, we try to put our confidence level next to it. So I would, I'd say I'm at 90, 95% confident that my critical power is going to be between 265 and 280 for, for, for okay. sure. And, and which coincides with how I would read this test as well, right? Because you would look at the last three are 270, 300. No, not even. That's not true. Because uh, I finished at 360, which is the last one. So that's 330 and that's 300. So the way I would look at this, um, I'd be in the neighborhood of, of, of 300. Um, which yeah right it's it's like if you're looking at this you get the flat down flat right so you would say well second threshold is this point right here somewhere around there and if I if I look at because I looked at my data from yesterday like I said I did a, a four one starting at a hundred and going up twenty five and I I would um, I just have the data in front of me here um, yeah I would look at two seventy five I was starting to flatten out at the bottom. And so I would, I would say that's right around where, where I would put that. So it's funny that on that shorter step, um, that shorter step, you don't see that flattening out, but 
had I done one more minute, uh, then I would have seen the the flattening out at the at the bottom, like I saw yesterday at two seventy five. And so that's yeah. kind of where I would have where I would have put it. And it's 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 interesting that you're using the three minute. I'd be I'd be curious to see the differences with the with the four minute because in my in my experience the I don't the first two minutes of the test for me are that you get that primary uh, that first uh, slope and then you have that delayed slope. But looking at the MO2 and the VO2 data as well and the respiratory data, for me the the interval starts at the two minute mark because you have 90 to 120 seconds of that slow component or not that slow component, but the initial component of, uh, let's say finding equilibrium between delivery and utilization. And so when I look at, when I, when I look at how hard someone is working, for example, I don't even look at the first 90 to 120 seconds. And I only look at the last two minutes of the four minutes step, because I feel like that's a lot more informative than whatever's coming before. So I'd be curious to see if uh, on a, on a four minute, you would find a slightly different uh, outcome. Uh, at least like looking at the data, I, I can see that that one extra minute at 175 brought a flat. We're here at 270. I'm, I'm not, not even close to, to, to flattening out. Um, so that's, that's what comes to mind, uh, but it'd be interesting to hear what, what you think. Yeah. And I, so, so this is the thing where I, with the advantage I find of NEARS is that um, you don't actually have to discuss on, hopefully I did the right protocol because yeah. the idea would actually be that you then have the moxie on when you're riding exactly, and you then identify after three minutes of riding, you get to identify four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 20 minutes later, right? What's still happening. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the times, if you're going to do a three, one or four, one or five, one, you, you, you pick the one that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, that is more like about, you know, giving you a first view of like, okay, this is kind of the, the what I'm working with. Yeah. Right. And then the idea would then be in the training to figure out what you were. And this has to do with, again, the day-to-day -day variation. You have to look how it's going to be that day anyways. Oh, a hundred percent. And so, I, yeah, so I, then you might as well, you have to check every day anyway. So this is more about, okay, it's about this. And then you, you go, you go and ride and kind of see how, how the system's responding. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I, yeah, I would yeah. definitely say that for me, you my, my zero O2 slope. I would, I would put it, I would, I would put that as my, my first threshold all day long. I would, I wouldn't even, yeah. put, it's because it's, it's, it's literally a hundred watt. Even if I'm a little bit off with my two point, three, uh, critical power, um, calculation. Um, and if I do do, I don't, I don't know if I have the fortitude and honestly the time to do five time trials to exhaustion, <laughs> nor the will, <laughs> I'd probably rather do a three minute all out test, <laughs> but, um, I still haven't gone myself to, to do that either. Um, but I, it's, oh, you gotta go do that. Come on. That's, that's the test. <laughs> I, <laughs> I heard, I heard it was, I heard it was, I, I've, yeah, I've, I haven't seen that kind of pain in a, in a while. Uh, when I was rowing, it was I, I, I would go down into that cave once in a while, but um, I haven't done the bike yet. I mean, I've done some the three minutes and the twelve minutes were I, I pushed hard, but um, yeah, I feel like three minute all out has to be the pinnacle of uh, pain caves, right? <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, I, in my experience, I've done it a bunch of times. Um, sometimes more and sometimes less motivating, motivated, but. Um, it's it's like the first 30 seconds are somewhat doable and then after that like a minute is just like death and you're like there's no way and then the end is somehow manageable again because okay. you basically just hit like something closer to critical power and it's just like that's all you got left anyways yeah it's not you you you've like done this to the max and it's now like, you can't do that anymore it's so like yeah, you're those... just like this is all i got so stop Friggin bothering me the, the, it's like so, the burning through w prime is what hurts <laughs> yeah it just you burn through that and then the system's like this is all um that's all i'm giving you man so you can stop this yeah and you just kind of you just kind of you're just going through the motions after that yeah yeah you know and, and people can yell at you that you know uh, you feel yelling back no you gotta keep going harder and then you, you're like you you like kind of in your brain you're like yeah i'm gonna try it. And there's nothing it doesn't matter yeah. anymore like you can't yeah, motivate yeah. yourself to, to kind of get any more and then you get off the bike and you fall over <laughs> your legs hurt for help yeah yeah so I, i've got to do that but again i i 
for me, it's clear that that zero slope in my yeah. in my case, and I'd, I'd be interested to see with the other data that you have on maybe cyclists what what they come back with if they say that it's closer to the the top or the bottom for them, and then also yeah. what the profile of their of their their test looks like. Yeah. So for the the for these professional uh, the soccer players, the professional football players, it's it is it's slightly above mm. threshold one if you do okay. the lactate data. Yeah. Um, and significantly lower than, than threshold two. So that, that would confirm what you're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, the, the idea is simple Then you, if you're, if you say, well, my calculated critical power is 260 or 270 or 280. I mean, you can, that's the double check is go ride at 280 for half an hour and see how you feel. And if yeah. you can maintain 280 for half an hour and it feels really hard the whole time, you're probably pretty close to critical power. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you can't maintain for half an hour, you, it's probably overestimated. I mean, yeah. it, it's always that question, like how long should be able to sustain critical power for? So well, I, I asked, I asked Kipchoge that to... does it for two hours, right? Yeah. But I... the fitter you are, the longer you can maintain it. The more unfit you are, the, the harder it is to maintain. And then it becomes a question of well, what is really critical power then? Because yeah. that would be filling in the data points. If you filled in an hour of data points, you would realize it's lower than the half an hour. Then it, for me, then it's more to do with functionality mm. of the, the discipline that a person's executing. So if you're never doing two hour things, then the two hour critical power isn't actually relevant for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I asked that yeah. very question to Andy Jones on, uh, oh. I, I think I asked him on Twitter, you know, what, what can we get from seeing how long we can main, sustain that critical power? And he said it was a non-starter in his opinion, because critical power itself doesn't tell you anything about uh, about the athlete. It's really just a demarcation between two domains of intensity and there's going to be different reactions above and below. But at that very point, um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily inform you about anything relevant, uh, which is not what I heard from. But that was in a different that was a, a pod, it was a podcast and they were not talking about this. They were talking about FTP. And they were saying, well, you have FTP and then how long you can ride at FTP is going to tell you how fit you are. And uh, so that was in a different context and not the same metric. And um, I know that the bo both are not the same, obviously, in at least how they derived and what they mean. Um, so that's that's what I got from that. How long could you do at critical power? It, 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 it just, from, from what I, end, or my, my way of seeing it, it, is it just that it just tells you what happens above. It just tells you how long you would, you would be able theoretically to sustain above within the confines of its applicability, which is a say two to 20 minute window, depending on what measurements you have. And then if you go shorter than this, then there's other systems at play. And so you need uh, another profile for that. And if you go longer than this, then there's also other things at play. And then you need, you need to, that, that power uh, profile that the cyclists use now where you have, I said, you have that critical, you have that say uh, relationship uh, between power and time and duration um, in that two to 20 minute bracket. And it's pretty clear that it looks like just like the, the, the theory looks, but then if you go shorter or you go longer, then the profile changes again. Um, and so that, that's, that's kind of what I have on that. I don't know if I'm probably wrong, but <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's interesting that what that 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 uh, President Jones says that. Um, I, I kind of really wonder what what he exactly means because. So I know he's got some papers. And I know he's worked with Brett, and Brett works with the guys from Exeter and Philip Skiba yeah. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And they did. A, I mean, he Brett's presented a bunch of data, and there's a bunch of publications from the groups as well that show, like, knowing critical speed is super important for like the whole Kipchoge thing was based on knowing his critical speed and knowing, yeah, he can break two hours. Mm -hmm. So this idea that it's irrelevant what maintaining your performance at critical speed, I don't know what that's supposed to tell you. It, and I was it, like, well, isn't that the whole modeling is based on knowing if you can maintain that speed or not? Well, below, if yes. you can't, then... But at, at the speed itself, I think his point was not that the, the metric is not usable because obviously <laughs> he's published on it probably more than most yeah. people. Uh, I think what he, what I understood at least is that the value that you get itself uh, and getting, trying to get right on that boundary doesn't necessarily tell you anything. You go 5% above, 5% below, you get a pretty clear difference in reaction. And so you can demarcate those domains of intensity, but 
how long you can sustain at the th mathematical, theoretical, or calculated value of critical power itself, that uh, doesn't really say anything because that's just the boundary between the two. And it doesn't, and, but, but maybe it depends on, like you said, the profile of the athlete and what their event is. And for, you might want to know that critical velocity for say a, a steeplechase runner and for a marathon runner, but how they're going to behave right at that boundary is not going to be the same. Uh, and, and I, I don't, I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm just talking out of my ass right now. Um, yeah, I mean, this might be me, me point discussing this without having, um, Andy Jones comment on what, what exactly means because I'm, I'm confused and well, what, what do you like? Why? I mean, the, the reason that you think Kipchoge can break two hours marathon is because of his identified critical speed versus other marathon runners. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't think he can actually run at that critical speed, if you tested him, because that's somehow you don't know how he's going to react, then how, how do you even predict, use the model to predict? I mean, there, there has to be some truth yes. to, to that speed that they're predicting. Now, yeah. obviously there's a range, plus minus 5% critical speed, often in lab settings, it becomes more complicated when you go into the real world, that you have to be careful that you might you might end up being over, you might end up being below, and the relevant point being isn't the number, but what's happening physiologically. Mm -hmm. Of course, that makes sense, but that doesn't change the fact that there is something, if you had all the data, there would be an output critical, which would be critical speed, and it would be important to know what that is and if that can be sustained at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And if yes or no, for how long and how it changes. Um, in my opinion, I mean, yeah, that, that would that be exactly sense. how you optimize, how you would optimize your, uh, your race pace. Yeah. Um, but it's, so I guess a little bit new point. I don't, I don't know what, what Andy Jones exactly meant, uh, in, in his reply, um, obviously mathematically derived values. You have to be careful what exactly that would mean. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't think it makes too much sense to keep talking about what maybe Andy Jones means. No, no, I, he said I, I agree. I agree. Uh, so, well, Andrew, that was, that was really, really interesting. Um, what's the next data that you need from me to make that move forward? <laughs> do yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. So, do I do that, yeah, I, you know, 30 minute at 170 or an hour at 170, an hour at 200? Um, do I, do I focus more? Do I, do I do some more tests on, on my critical power side? What, what's more interesting to you? Um, yeah, so for, for the Moxie form itself, what we're going to get people to do, uh, probably starting next week or so, is you run the test again, but um, like zoom in on that point that, that I'll put this data up on the form for you. Mm -hmm. So you would zoom in around on that point around 180 watts where you do, yep. you know, small, like maybe 10 watt steps. So from, uh, from know, 50 a, to 220 or something like that? No, I would do like, like 160, 170, 180, 190, 200, 210. Yep. Like, like right around there. Still three minutes. Fill that in. Yeah. Three minutes, the same thing and see what, what that does. Like if, do we get that nice linear response again? What does it do for the intercept? That's kind of the next step. It's like increasing the resolution around that zero yep. slope. Yeah. So 160, um, that, 70, 80, 90, 200. So, something like that. 210, you know, something, whatever the amount of steps you want to do, but a yep. couple below 180 and a, a couple above, above 180. Does does uh, um, does the VO two data help you at all, or do you just want the Moxie? Um, you do whatever you want. I haven't looked at the VO two data for this, right, so, so I'll just do the Moxies. So I'll do yeah. I'll do the same left right VL and um, and awesome. the right right bicep, and I'll awesome cool. I I might yeah. uh, tomorrow's a tomorrow's not a possibility, but I think Thursday yeah, I'll yeah. I'll have time to do that. Yeah, yeah. T take a look. Um, and the other thing would be yeah, you know, trying to um, you know, saying well. I, how do you feel of like with like a half an hour ride um, at, at these different intensities, right? Um, mm. So if you say you've been doing your long rides at 170 and I'm assuming because that's threshold one and you're yep. feeling pretty solid on those, like I'm assuming that feels super good. Mm. I'm assuming the 200 watt would feel pretty good too. It'd feel harder. I know I know yeah. it would because I, I, I know I definitely go into, it just, it changes. But yeah. if you, if you feel like that's also something interesting, I could do a, an hour with the Moxies at 170 and then an hour with the Moxies at 200. Yeah. Actually, if you can do that, 
That would be cool and do it with the VO2 data. Okay. Because you, you know if you want to, I don't know. Component. Right, yeah, you, yeah. Let me yeah. just I'm just gonna write it down so I don't forget what I need to do. Uh ongoing, yeah. ongoing live uh, N of one research. It's fun. I like there it. You go. So 160 plus 10 watts, and that's a 3 1. Um, and then I also do uh th- what do you need? 30 minutes or 60 minutes at 70, 170 and 200. I just do 30 minutes or do, do 30 minutes. And if you want to keep doing it, take your mask off and do another 30 minutes. But I, I feel bad for doing a 60 minutes with a face mask on. I, I do it. I do it for fun. So don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you I'll, haven't done a three minute all out test. I got to understand you. <laughs> I'll put 60 minutes at 170 and 60 minutes at 200. And then so test to do. Okay. I'll do, I'll do that. That'll be done hopefully in the next week. And then I'll, I'll send you the data and then we could maybe do an update call with, with that. Um, see what you came out with. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Perfect. Sounds right, good. Man. Well, that um, was, uh, any, any last no, words? Fun. Oh, last word for me, uh, go check out near science, uh, YouTube channel. That's Andrew's <laughs> YouTube channel. Um, Thanks, I'll put the, I'll put the link in the description. I, I looked, I watched all your videos uh, and now I'm always excited when you post a new one. So for people who are yeah, in, slow. in NIRS and, and uh, physiology, go, go check out his channel. Uh, but if you have any other words, any other last words, Andrew, go ahead. No, no, I'm good. I hey, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting me on and talking to me and sending me your data. So I hope this is interesting. I hope it gets people kind of looking at this slope data a little bit different. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's very interesting. Um, all right, man. Nice. Thanks.